My name is Suniti Dernosik, and I live in Portland, Oregon. When I was young, my father was a Hare Krishna devotee, and so there was this Eastern influence from the very beginning. And as all children, you just kind of follow along with whatever's happening. And so I found myself in a lot of temples. So then as time went on, I moved out and lived on the reservation and had an incredible experience there with my family. And then I went to Wisconsin to study dance. And I was enrolled in, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, getting my bachelor's degree in fine arts, studying dance. And I met a woman named Janet Lilly, and she was going to be my yoga teacher, and she was also my dance professor. So it was just so sweet to study with someone who had an incredible awareness of their own body. And she was, I studied with her for four years, and I didn't even know there was anything else besides Iyengar yoga. It was just that, and I was really devoted to the practice. It seamlessly kind of weaved with my dance training because she was one of my main teachers at the time. And I just kept with it after that, eventually moving to Portland, Oregon, and studying with a variety of teachers and having a really great experience in the yoga community there. So I always loved to move my body. I would go out with my friends and we would dance and just play. I just loved having an interaction with my body. I rode my bike when I was 14 from Wisconsin to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I just was always being physical, loved being in my body, moving my body. And yet, I had a very strong meditation practice. So I also enjoyed sitting still. I still enjoy sitting still. When I was 16, I met a teacher, Chagdu Tukul Rinpoche, and he taught me to meditate. He taught me how to sit still. And I've been studying in that lineage since then. So when I found yoga, I was about 18, 19 years old, and I was already like way into meditating and totally into a spiritual practice. And so yoga was a, really like the first time that I felt like, oh, this is movement in meditation. Because dance really felt like it was satisfying this creative movement in my body and my imagination and, and my spirit, for sure. And then, but yoga talked about it more. It was like there was the more of the teachings that were there that were very much in line with what I was learning through all of my spiritual practices. So it's been, you know, my, my process of being in, in my body has been a real, like, trying to not compartmentalize all these things. I'm a dancer. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm an activist. How do they come together? How do they blend? I'm a mom, you know? So how do all these things come together? And yoga is very much there. Like, all of the teachings are, are right there. Well, right now, I have this real, like, home practice where I have to tend to a baby, and I have to tend to chores, and I'm in relationship with my partner. And unless my practices are moving through me to inform whatever that is, they just don't have any weight. It's like, why, why bother? So for me, it's not important anymore to like accomplish any kind of amazing feats with my body. It's more of like, how are these practices moving through me so that I can be in relationship, so that I can have a connection? I mean, yoga is intimacy. It's becoming intimate with our bodies, with our breath, with our minds, with each other, with community. So they come together through intimacy, through noticing, through being alive, through being awake. And then, of course, you totally fail at all of it. I'm failing at it all of the time. And then noticing that, and then coming back, trying again. Noticing the fail failure is part of it. Whatever that failure means, it's you know, not like success or failure, but it's, ah, uh, I wasn't arriving to that challenge as I would have hoped to. So I still practice Tibetan Buddhism. It shifted quite a lot. So I went through like a real traditional kind of teachings, um, practices, and then a couple years ago, my, I went and studied with the, my main teacher, Lama Drime, again, and he shifted his practice, and it was so sweet because it like, gave me permission to also shift my practice, and so I was going through a very like traditional like 
preliminary practices, first year retreat, second year retreat. And then he branched off and started working with this woman, Susan Harper, who does this continuum movement. And so his Vajrayana Buddhism was mixed with all of her movement and dance and stories, and it was just wonderful. And so Vajrayana Buddhism is still part of my practice, but it isn't as rigid as I had been practicing it for so long, which feels good. It's just like creating a little bit more space to see how all of these other parts of myself can enter into that. But yeah, it's still there. I still go on retreats and stuff like that. When I feel in balance, in balance and even a yoga posture, it's like I come into the shape and then I adjust myself just so that a smile comes on my, onto my face. My mouth starts to open like the upper palate of my mouth domes. There's a, a deepening and an awareness of my breath as well as the space beneath me and the space around me and I'm aware of my thoughts. So there becomes an inclusive experience rather than an exclusive experience. So when I feel like I'm in balance in my life, I'm not just moving from just momentum, from just um, being swept by a feeling. I'm alive for it. It's like my, I'm responding from a place of space and openness and choice. So it's similar. I'll be in a situation that's requiring an enormous amount of work to stay present with. And I could um, just respond and be angry. And actually, sometimes you do respond and be angry. Like if my kiddo is about to run into the street, I'm not just softly directing her, I direct her. There's a firmness. And that's, you have to, you know, there's a, a response that comes in. But the response can be wakeful. So it doesn't feel like it's compelled by um, greed or jealousy or any of the other things that could ride up, rise up. So responding and being in balance in life feels wakeful, it feels inclusive, it feels like I'm alive in my body, I'm with my thoughts coming and going, I'm with my breath and I'm with you and I'm with this world and I'm in this community. So it's a, it's like entering in. So right now, I have been spending more time in the studio. I have a, a dance space that I share with some other dancers and choreographers, and we each have our allotted time. So I've been spending time in the studio just playing and dancing and moving my body. And there's this, um, all of this really sweet freedom that I've been finding in my joints and space between my breath and space in my shoulders, and space in my hips. And, and after the practice of just free playing, improvisation, um, I feel so bright. It's like my skin brightened. And so I've been working on this dance with another um, woman who's been singing. And I'm in love with like a personal practice, being able to, to meet up and collaborate and then two people with personal practices meeting. And that, that thing that's happening right there is just so beautiful and so inspiring. And, and I leave just feeling like a huge inhale, like so excited about life. Two people immersed in a personal practice and then meeting to share what they've done and make something together. I did my first training with a woman named Uma Kleppinger, and I did it to, to just learn more, not really anticipating being a teacher, although it was always sort of in the back of my mind having all of my dance training. Being, and because I wanted to create space as a dancer, I did a lot of work, working in restaurants, working at front desks, doing all this other kind of stuff that didn't require a lot of commitment because I wanted have all the space and time to dance and to perform and to tour and so just really focusing on on dance and so the other stuff couldn't take up too much space. I had a lot of friends that were yoga teachers and I thought maybe you know that would be a good way to make a living. I'm already in my body so so I did my first training 
And a woman offered me a job like that, just like, I'm opening a studio, you should come teach for me. Are you sure? <laughs> so I did, and it was perfect because the classes were really small, and I got to build, build my voice and build my confidence working with just a few people in the room. So that was a really sweet experience, and that was like 10 years ago now. Being part of a yoga community has been so amazingly bright for me. It's a place where I've met a lot of friends and been inspired by other teachers, learned from master teachers, been around really, you know, those beings that just like ugh, blow you away when you meet them. And a lot of that has been, happened because I've been part of a community that's focused on exploring more light in their own life and how to share that with others. It's really incredible that we can all come together to move our bodies together, to move our minds into our breath and into our bodies so that we stop reaching and reacting but just fall back to really see what's going on. It's quite amazing. And just like in an asana practice where we, we, we really feel fire in our arms or in our legs and to really feel that that's a really amazing training. And to then to really be able to feel that in our relationships, whatever's arising in our communities with each other. I mean, this yoga, the yoga community is, is really, has been really bright and supportive for me. The past few years after becoming a mom, I've really had to work without, become, without like be getting too overextended, without reaching out too far. And of course, it's inevitable. Our lives get really busy, and especially if you're holding space for little children, it's, it's a wild ride. And so these last few years, particularly, I've had to pull back and like look at all of the different things that I've been learning of like, what grounds us? How do we get grounded? And so in a lot of the series that I'm working with for this work, there's a lot of referencing towards grounding down into the earth to expand out or finding places to hold, finding places to connect in so that you can reach out without being taken off balance. And then notice when you're being taken off balance and really looking at it, like, is there another option? Is there a place to root down? Is there a place to connect? The time that I've spent in nature has been so incredibly informative and nourishing and it's helped me create like a sustaining existence so that relationship of being able to connect truly to the earth so that your body can be more fluid and then with that fluidity it's like your watery state you're able to connect more to the air and to the space and reach out so and, and then it's like, it's like tuning a, a guitar. You don't want to get too tight or too loose. If you get too grounded, we know what that kind of state is, and we can sense how that affects our breath and our emotions. And then if you get too airy or if you get too watery, you get taken off your feet. It can be kind of unbalancing. So it's always just finding that delicate balance, of course. It's a lot easier said than done. But it's particularly interesting for me just to notice how am I relating to the floor? How am I relating to the sky? How is that moving through me? How am I able to re reach out, connect to someone else without being taken off balance? And so I feel really fortunate to have had the opportunity to study with really amazing teachers that when I'm around them, they you know, there's this, this sense when you're around really great teachers of like wanting to bow. It's this humbling act of, of giving up everything that you think you know to learn something new. It's like, ah, oh, to bow. So sweet. And so some of those teachers are the people that I've done just my trainings with. Uma Kleppinger and Tiffany Kruikshank have helped me so much to, to develop confidence as being a teacher. And before that, I had my first teacher, Janet Lilly, who's an Iyengar teacher and has been an 
an amazing influence. I still can hear her voice sometimes because I studied with her for four years, just her, in, you know, for my yoga training. And then there was my meditation teachers, Chagdu Tukul Rinpoche and Lama Dreame. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of continuing education with some really great teachers. I've done some work with Doug Keller, and I'm particularly inspired by Michael Stone. And right now, I take classes with Todd Jackson. And he's an Iyengar-based teacher who does all this inner body work. And he blows my mind every time. So, yeah, always grateful. In my experience, you can't really force confidence. It has to come from practice. When I was in dance training, I would always start at the back of the room. And, and then I'd watch how my confidence would grow and by the end of it, I would be in the front of the room, in center. And then they'd make me go to a higher level class and then I would do that same thing again. And it was just through the practice that I was able to have the confidence to just be in my body. And you can't really force that. And so there's, um, I've found for myself, like just really committing to my practice is how I've become a more confident teacher. The more I know with my own body, the more I've become curious with my breath, the more questions I've asked, the more I can be engaged with my students.